Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. And welcome to this conference. So we're going to discuss the current position on the proposals for the two pillars of international tax reform, which the OECD published last month. There's a lot going on in the world at the moment with the pandemic, disputed election results, and the closer to home here, at least, still uncertainty over whether the UK can make a trade deal with the EU. But judging by the record numbers that have registered for this conference, the future of international tax, taxation of profit is also an issue of great interest and contention. So my name is Michael Devera. I'm an economist and I'm director of the Oxford University Centre for Business Taxation, which is an independent research centre based in the side business school at Oxford University. The centre has been undertaking and publishing research on the impact of business taxes and also writing on policy issues for around 15 years. So I'm going to be chairing today's conference with two of my colleagues, Richard Collier, who's an associate fellow of the centre and who's also worked closely with the OECD on these proposals, and John Vella, who's a professor of law at Oxford and also assistant director at the centre. So our aim today is really to take stock of the current position. So some questions we'd like to address are, what are the key elements of the proposals? How do we get here? And what kind of compromises have been made along the way by members of the inclusive framework? What, if anything, in the proposals is already set in stone and what's up for further discussion? What are the next steps? And what are the likely outcomes next year? And indeed, how likely are we to see any agreement on these proposals? And what do we think is likely to happen if there's no agreement? So we have an outstanding lineup of speakers and panelists to discuss these questions with us. So we're going to begin with a session to set the scene with Pascal Santaman and Akin Prost from the OECD, who I'll introduce just uh, in further in just a moment. We're then going to have a session with four members of the steering group of the Inclusive Framework, from whom we hope to learn something of the discussions that have been taking place and the difficulties that have risen and are likely to raise in, in the future. Then we'll have a session with external views, including from business and a professional firm. And I've added myself to that session to give at least one view from academia. Then we'll finish with Pascal just to review where we are heading to next. So that's the plan. There's a great deal to talk about and even a few hours is unlikely to be sufficient. We do hope to make this event uh, at least partially interactive so you can uh, ask questions and make comments by writing in, if you press the Q&A button on your Zoom screen, you should be able to make a question in writing uh, and we will try and pick up those questions as we go along. It's probably best to make your question or add your comment in the session that uh, it's relevant for. So the first one will be for Pascal and Akim and so on from there. Um, so without further ado, we have a lot to talk about. Let's make a start. So let me introduce the first two speakers. If they need introduction, I'm sure they're very well known to the international tax community. So Pascal Santaman has been director of the Center for Tax Policy and Administration at the OECD since 2012, and he's been a senior official there since 2007. And he has been the leader of and the face of the BEPS project since he began it in 2013. And he's been instrumental in the huge shakeup of the international tax system that we've witnessed over that time. And at his side has been Akim Pross, who is the head of the International Cooperation and Tax Administration Division of the Centre, and has a number of important responsibilities within the um, BEPS Action Plan. So together, they've been instrumental in leading the inclusive framework to the position where we now have at least some detailed, reasonably detailed proposals to discuss. There just simply is nobody better placed than Pascal and Akim to summarise the current position. So with that, I would like to hand over to Pascal and Akim. I think Pascal will go first to summarize where we are. And um, Pascal, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Michael. Good uh, morning, afternoon, whatever, wherever you are in the world. Uh, happy to be with you with a, uh, a number of very distinguished uh, panelists uh, for a good conversation in a good place, the good place being both Oxford and internet. As, Again, we're meeting virtually. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Mike, for the invitation, for giving us an opportunity to discuss again this issue, uh, which is not yet solved, uh, which may be solved, 
or not, we'll see, and, and we'll come back to that at the closing of this meeting. Um, as an introduction, I would just like to um, uh, try to set the scene, um, a broad picture, and, uh, and share that with Arim, who will get into a bit more details of, of the structure of uh, PILO 1 and uh, PILO 2. Uh, but to start with, um, maybe, I mean, three basic questions. Uh, where do we come from, where we are, and uh, where are we heading, right? Um, where do we come from? Um, we come from a um, international tax system, which basically has not fundamentally changed since uh, 1928. The first significant attempt to change the frame or at least start thinking out of the box uh, was introduced in 2012, 2013 with the BEPS project. Some would see it as, as, uh, as a sea change. Um, uh, some would say, well, they just tried to patch the system. Uh, and I think among economists, as well as lawyers, there is the view that the system, the current system, has some merits, but also has a number of flaws. So um, when, because of globalization, raising a number of problems, the G20 politically decided that it was time to address the tax haven issue and beyond the tax haven issue, the uh, issue of the taxation of multinational companies, and there is a link between both, um, uh, we, we, we did the BEPS project and, and among the actions we identified the challenges arising because of the digitalization of the economy. And um, since 2017, the end of 17, uh, we've uh, come back to this issue, which had been closed more or less in 2015 at the deliver of the BEPS project with the US fundamentally telling the rest of the world that they did not see a real problem. And as a result, we shouldn't uh, talk about that, uh, just revisit it after the implementation of the BEPS project, knowing that in 2015, one of the issues uh, raised by countries were the double non-taxation of the profits of, of highly visible tech companies, and not only tech companies, but uh, and mainly US tech companies operating in Europe uh, and elsewhere with these profits untaxed in Europe, untaxed in Ireland, untaxed in Bermuda, and untaxed in the US as long as they were not distributed. So the, the door was closed. Things changed in 2017 with the US tax reform, because when the US tax reform allowed for the taxation of these profits. So there is no longer double non-taxation. There is at least a taxation in the US with uh, guilty at least at uh, 10%. Uh, but also the US tax reform, I think, um, uh, even though it didn't really bring a response to the question of the destination principle or the change of, of, of transfer pricing rules to anchor um, uh, profits a bit more in the market jurisdiction. They raised the question of where the profits should go beyond the traditional distinction between source and, and residence. And, and because of that, in 2017, we reopened the discussion uh, and it's been two years to three years actually now, 18, 19, 20, with pretty intense discussion. So that's where we come from. Where are we today? After three years of work, and Arim will get uh, into the architecture of both Blueprint 1 and Blueprint 2 reports, but, but we have, I think, a, an agreement that a solution should include two pillars, even though there is no consensus. Some countries say that we should not link both pillars. Some countries say that they should be linked. Some countries like the idea of having a global solution. Some other countries are a bit less enthused with that. But uh, there is, I think, the idea now that there will be two main components of, of uh, this uh, tax reform. One, a uh, pillar one with two ideas. One, which is a new nexus being able to tax a foreign company, even though it doesn't have a permanent establishment or a fixed place of business or a physical presence. And two, if it is the case, a new um, layer of profit allocation rules, which would add to the existing rules, which I think everybody, not everybody, but most people would recognize work for 
routine return for uh, um, um, activities, um, most, most of the transactions, let's say, but not most of the value, which is in intangible property. And the intangible property is the one generating the rents. And there, I think there is a recognition that the Armstrong principle doesn't work. So pillar one would, in addition to the nexus, add a layer to the existing rules to allocate part of the residual profit of some companies, those interacting in a sustained manner with the market to the market jurisdiction, or at least a portion of this residual profit to the market jurisdiction, together with increased tax certainty, which is part of the trade-off of, of the balance. And a pillar two, which is what we tried to get adopted through action three of the BEPS action plan, which was the idea that you should have strengthened CFC and going beyond strengthened CFCs and, and address the weaknesses of the work on harmful tax practices, where every time you close down a harmful tax regime, you may end up with a more generous uh, bag, I mean, more generous uh, tax regime offered to all the companies with no ring fencing and so so at the end of the day you wonder why you, you're doing all this work if it actually is providing more substance to jurisdictions where there was no substance. Uh, it's a bit contrary to the philosophy of BEPS which was to say let's realign the profits with the location of the activities well, sometimes we can see the reallocation of the activities where the profits were booked, which, which was not necessarily the policy guiding all the efforts. So we have these two blueprints. Um, uh, we develop them technically, even though the political conversation has been a bit um, erratic, let's say, with uh, some countries, uh, and one country in particular, I think we can say with the US, saying you cannot ring fence the solution on P1 uh, to digital companies, but every time there are attempts to reflect the US use and go beyond uh, ring fencing, well, the US business is at stake, say, well, no, you, 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 you'd better ring fence with, with something like a dead end, which uh, could be illustrated by the safe harbor proposal to say companies will end up choosing their their um, um, their regime, uh, new regime or old regime. And and pillar two, as I said, uh, we tried through pillar through action three of the BEPS action plan, didn't work well. The U.S. actually implemented uh, action three and went beyond with uh, guilty. And now many countries say, well, we want the same. Uh, uh, and uh, and the U.S. is of course in favor as it would level with the playing field. So that's where we are. Two blueprints with the architecture Arim will describe. What's next? We'll see. What, what, what is known is that we have an extension of the deadline, which was year end, year of 2020. And, and this uh, now is extended till mid-21. One could say another six months after eight years of lagging behind. Some would say another six months to conclude uh, such a difficult agreement with an administration which doesn't start until the 20th of January, which needs to have confirmation of political appointees by the Senate, which may take another couple of months, means that you will have only a few weeks to decide on the way forward. That's where we are. Uh, I'm pretty sure we'll come back to all that after listening to the panelists and uh, to set the scene, uh, Arim, Arim, over to you. First important step is to unmute myself, otherwise this is rather dull. Um, thank you for inviting me. Thanks, Mike, for the introduction. And also thanks for saying that our proposals were at least reasonably detailed. We've heard other people that thought they were far too detailed with 500 pages, but I think that's also the difference between the academia. So it's so much appreciated. Thanks a lot. Um, I think I have about 10, 15 minutes. I'm not going to go into every detail of the technical design of, of Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. That'd be impossible, but just to give you a bit of a flavor, I think, starting as the number would indicate and um, against me otherwise being associated with pillar two too strongly let me start with, with pillar one um, some of the technical design challenges and sort of the key questions and the question i guess as pascal has already indicated scope and scope has a, a conceptual and intellectual component first of all you know because i think there is broad recognition when we speak that more or less most people accept that we need a new nexus rule there are certain businesses, there are certain things that are happening today that didn't happen in the 1920s when the League of Nations came up with a permanent establishment where you are can, where you can now participate in a foreign market in ways um, that digitalization, but also globalization and other things allow you today that weren't possible maybe 100 years ago. And so I think broadly, most people would accept that we cannot determine 
taxing rights exclusively by reference to presence alone. And the question then is, well, if that's the case, where does that apply? Does that apply in a narrow scope of business? Is it evolving? Does it apply to a broader scope? If we are doing rulemaking that is not meant to be changed every other year, where is a sensible line to draw? And some people might be saying, draw no line, convert it completely, go to a destination. So I think that's one of the key questions. Where do you draw the line in terms of the scope? Recognizing that I think most people would accept, at least for some business models or for some parts of the economy, clearly you can be extremely present in a foreign market that you target specifically, where you engage with people in ways that is possible to do without the indicia of traditional physical presence. And so that's the scope question. I think everybody also recognizes then that if you are creating this new nexus rules, which I think broadly everybody agrees in some scope, question being which scope, that that then also means you need to change the transfer pricing rule because they, they translate notions of physical physicality, I think, over in the transfer pricing area. So there wouldn't be point to have a, a nexus and, and then you have a zero profit PE. So I think people also accept that there is something where we need to do changes to transfer pricing or maybe speaking more fundamentally, other forms of profit allocation to that new nexus. I think uh, that's also broadly accepted and it's a follow on. There are challenges in of course, determining the scope, defining the nexus, developing the revenue sourcing and revenue sourcing in some sense, I mean, look at it technically has some knock on effects on, on, on scope. There are certain businesses, for instance, B2B businesses, as you would know, Michael as well, you know, where determining the source is very, very challenging because you also need to translate this into something um, where you don't have to trace through an unrelated uh, supply chain that, that would make it impossible. So, so we have this dimension of what is the right approach and what can actually be implemented at reasonable compliance costs. I think we then, um, as we have said, we are going after something uh, that, that looks into, if you wish, you know, and you've seen this in the profitability on there's a new nexus, there's a new transfer pricing rules that build heavily on financial accounting rules that try to exclude a certain routine return and, and try to sort of find the non-routine component. And that raises challenges of how you determine this. Oh, what's the profit before tax measure? What adjustments do we do? Where you also have some connections um, that we do see between the pillar two and the pillar one. And, and maybe there's some helpful technology that we can borrow and sort of make it consistent across the pillars. Then there's the big question of segmentation. You know, if you've decided this is the type of revenue, this is the type of business that is in scope, what if that business also had other businesses that are potentially not in scope? If everything is in scope, you don't have that question, but assume not everything is in scope, what do you do? What sort of level of approximation do you tolerate? And, you know, in some sense, we always knew that net was going to be more difficult than gross, but we're also here in a project that is trying to find a sensible measure of net, balancing accuracy with the necessary compliance implications, and then translating this into a system that also eliminates double taxation. That does require trade-offs, so we're working on further simplification to the way we do the segmentation, which we clearly realize, and business is very clear, um, is, is one of the drivers of complexity here. So we're trying to find ways that leave us with a sensible and uh, defensible measure of net profit, but do so in a way that can also be done at a reasonable compliance cost. And you know, we benefit hopefully also from discussions today and more also the public consultation. Can we make this simpler? How can we make this simpler? There's a question on losses. And I think there's a recognition that we will not be spreading around to Mount A um, if over the cycle here, uh, this is loss making. How do you do this nevertheless? You need to capture the losses of the segment. You need to sort of have carry forward provisions. Again, there's something about the policy and something about the compliance costs. And then maybe just finishing up here briefly on, on other elements I think that are important. Um, in the design of the pillar, how do you do the profit allocation? There's a question about the numbers. In some sense, that's a, a negotiation as much also as, as an overall conceptual approach. Where do you have cutoff points? Do you have profitability thresholds? What sort of percentages you take? How specifically accurate do you make this? Rather than 
easier? You know, what, what are some of the differentiations? And again, it may depend on the scope that you do that also has an implication here. And in running through the rest, I think there is the big question of elimination. It is challenging. And of course, segmentation impacts elimination. Some of the decisions you do there may have impacts on how you run the elimination system. But the challenge that we accept is that we don't want to design a system that leaves you with double taxation. Um, so very important that we try um, to integrate this, even if it comes at a certain degree of complexity. And then the last elements I think to mention is tax certainty, very important. Tax certainty certainly for the new taxing right, the amount A, but also tax certainty beyond the new taxing right. So potentially that you create additional tax certainty beyond what we have to do in areas such as transfer pricing and permanent establishment and the discussion that is ongoing. And I'm sure we hear more about it. You know, what is the degree of openness and where can we reach political agreement on how much further beyond the amount A that goes? And then there's an important question of implementation, multilateral convention, how this gets done, including also of administration. So as much as possible, we come up with a collective filing process through the tax certainty process that goes hand in glove with all of this. So we don't leave companies hanging where one country determines you're in scope and the other country says you're not in scope. So these questions need to be necessarily, I would think, decided collectively. Um, and then a quick word in the remaining five, 10 minutes, perhaps on pillar two. Um, pillar two, I think you know that we have um, uh, different components that make up pillar two, as Pascal has indicated. You know, this goes back to action three, but also the unhappiness with action five and some of the patent boxes that seem to be getting bigger every time we have an FHTP meeting. Um, uh, questions that people have on, you know, how viable eight to nine are with respect to in practice and in concept getting to the right place where um, um, residual returns from intelligibles should be located. So, so there's a collection, there's guilty in the US that drove the momentum also here. And I guess it also feeds into the narrative sometimes that, you know, we have to ensure that, you know, large profitable businesses pay at least a certain level of tax in every country where they operate. Um, now, in terms of the technical questions, I think, you know that we have an income inclusion rule, which is in some sense a CFC rule. Um, it's a more extensive CFC rule relative to what we know. And then there is, you know, a backup rule, but it isn't just a backup rule. It's a so-called under tax payment rule um, that would not apply where there already is an income inclusion rule. But of course, it does do apply where the income inclusion rule does not apply, for instance, in the parent jurisdiction where typically CFC rules. Uh, don't apply. It's of course, as always, maybe of increasingly less relevance to the UK, but for other countries in Europe, question of EU law implications and all of this, and I think that's something to reflect upon. Um, and then there's a third rule, which is the subject to tax rule, and I think we'll we'll hear more about this, but just conceptually how they fit together, the, the under tax payment rule and the income inclusion rule are in some sense, if you were sort of the more systemic rules that are um, uh, understood by the proponents of the pillar as creating a, if you wish, a minimum tax infrastructure that isn't so much about who gets how much money, but more about you know, having a minimum level of tax and finding a system that achieves this in the most efficient way which is part of the reason that there is a, a benefit for having the income inclusion rule come first, simply because it's an easier rule to apply to the under tax payment rule. And then the subject to tax rule, I think, is a more specific, a more bilateral, less a systemic rule, if you think about it like that, um, that seeks to address a situation where a country may have ceded taxing right in connection with a treaty on the assumption that the recipient of income that that, that benefits from, from treaty deductions or other treaty benefits would be subject to tax at a certain level of tax. And if this is not the case, then that country wishes to retain that taxing right that it has otherwise ceded in the tax treaty um, without needing to terminate the treaty itself. So it's a, it's a complement, if you wish, and it sits differently. And also in the discussion, uh, the subject to tax is more based on a nominal tax concept, whereas the income inclusion rule and the under tax payment rule are more focused on an effective rate of taxation. 
Um, the big question amongst others, of course, you know, we talk about the politics, but a big question on the technical side is how can you make pillar two simpler? And, and that cuts across both pillars. I mentioned segmentation and pillar one, so I mentioned this. Um, there's a couple of things I think uh, that we are working on in terms of the simplification. I think there's a very broad openness of coming up with ideas that do not undermine what the tax policy is seeking to achieve, but do that in more intelligent ways. There's four or five, I don't have the time to go through that we list in the blueprint options that may be useful. Um, the CBC safe harbor ideas, there's also ideas that you know, tax administration guidance, all the idea being that if you are a large group, a large UK group, for instance, then probably, you know, you're not anywhere near like where this min tax would be in a small number of the countries you operate. And so how can we find mechanisms that we try to focus in so you actually only need to do the calculation where there is a realistic expectation that there may actually be an inclusion either under the income inclusion rule or if that does not exist or does not apply under the under tax payment rule. So how do you make this more focused? And it's a bit of a catch 22 because of course, so very often you would have to do the calculation to find out that you don't have to do the calculation, but then you've done the calculation. So, so how can you find ways where you can rely on proxies and do other things so that you don't actually have to engage in the compliance cost just in order to find out that really there wasn't anything? That's a challenge we see in CFC rules. So we're very open. And let me let me just mention here that you know I think government delegates realized that they did not know everything. Um, which is also why there is a public consultation, meaning that we have indicated from the government delegates that there's a whole number of simplifications um, that we're studying, but that's not an exhaustive list. Um, you know, it didn't make much sense that um, it's governments that decide what would be easier for business to do without having had the discussion with business and others. So there may be other ways that this could be simplified. And we've also heard from a lot of businesses already some ideas. So we're looking forward to any sort of ideas on simplification on the discussions. Not to say that that's the only question, I think, on Pillar 2. You know, we've heard from Pascal, there's also the wider political question. There's, there's questions on um, uh, the minimum rate itself. There's, there's many other questions, how you implement it. Is it a floor? Is it a cap? How does the multilateral convention work? Do you need one for Pillar 2? Would it be useful if you don't need one? Clearly, um, as we can see in the US, you can proceed on your own, you can legislate guilty, you can legislate other things, but would it make sense? And so what are some of the options? So um, I think simplification, very important, um, but certainly not the only question. I hope that's a bit of a useful scene setting where some of the technical and design challenges are across the pillars. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction to, uh, to both of you. Um, I have a, a stack of questions and I won't ask them all now. I hope we'll get to some of them um, during the course of the afternoon, our afternoon. Can I just, go, let me ask one or two though. Um, so I think you've both mentioned the kind of political difficulties and the technical difficulties. So, you know, if we're thinking now about, you know, what are the difficulties in getting a consensus? Are they political? Are they technical? Is it some kind of, are they inextricably entwined? I mean, to put that in the context, I mean, you've, in a sense, you're both you both kind of must be extremely ambitious. You're trying to kind of invent two new major elements of the tax system, you know, in consultation with 140 countries. Um, that's you know that's quite an impressive. Uh, it'd be impressive achievement. It's impressive even to think you might do it. Um, so, what are those kind of key difficulties? Do you see them as kind of technical or political or, or both? Really, um, they're both clearly. However. The technical difficulties, I think, will be not easily, but will be solved if the political difficulties are surmounted or overcome. Um, among the political difficulties, there is one which is probably the mother of all the other difficulties, which is the scope. And, and if you look back to the uh, initial report in 2018, March 2018, um, the conclusions of the report uh, were that uh, there was a divide between those in favor of a um, ring-fenced approach or those in favor of focusing the work on what they considered was new, 
highly digitalized business model. And I think the UK has been a pretty eloquent advocate of that position. And the US, and at that time, China uh, in particular, but not limited to these two countries, saying you cannot ring fence as per the conclusion reached by the action one of the BEPS uh, project uh, in 2015. And it is true that this question of scope is the mother of all pending political questions because it has an impact whether you go for a small scope or a broader scope, it has an impact on the revenue of the countries and therefore their own self-interest and therefore their positioning. Let's not forget that the international community is made of selfish states and so be it. Each state, each government has to protect the interest of its own people um, and own system or own companies. Um, so, um, uh, the revenue implications are, are pretty important. I didn't mention in my introduction, I should have, the, um, uh, the impact assessment and the fact that uh, uh, what would be moved by uh, Pillar 1 would be quite limited, 100 billion euros shifted from some countries to another with a net increase of only uh, something like 10 to, to 14 uh, billion euros, which is pretty small overall, given the reform that we're talking about, while pillar two would be a net increase, depending on whether you include guilty, which is already passed or not, but the net increase without guilty of uh, up to 60 to 80 um, billion um, uh, dollars, I think we're, we're talking uh, in dollars. So the scope is very important, but, but from the scope, um, uh, they arrive a number of, of other political issues uh, on, on uh, what exactly you put in there, how you organize um, uh, the uh, elimination of double taxation, which sounds like a technical issue, but is also a political issue. Do you take the money first from what one would call the tax haven, or do you take from the countries of residence? How do you reach the balance and so? But if we have leadership on the question of scope, I think the technical questions business line segmentation, elimination of double taxation, scope in the implementation, which are also political because whether you go for a multilateral convention or not is at least in some countries, a, a real political issue. But I think these technical issues would, I mean, they, they can be solved. Uh, so they're intertwined, but fundamentally what we're missing on pillar one is leadership. And I would say leadership from the, the, the largest countries of, of all members of the inclusive framework, which is the one which has hesitated saying broad scope. And when we provided for the broad scope uh, in um, uh, October 2019 with the unified approach, which basically reflected what we thought the views of the US uh, were, uh, then we had these countries saying, well, actually, we're not so sure. Let's go for a safe harbor. Maybe if I may just supplement so you have a slight flavor, I, I fully agree. So, so scope is certainly the key question. Um, I think there are also other questions, and so it's intertwined. I, I think there is also the question on tech certainty, you know, which, which is clearly a sensitive and also political question. And you know, that's been indicated quite clearly that we do this, we introduce new elements. We need to think about what we can do with the tax certainty for businesses today and tomorrow. So that's, I think, an important political dimension. And then in some sense, when you look at the, the, the technical side, I think that technical side can be solved, but we also owe it to the system that we create a system where we achieve those objectives, but in a way that you know businesses can actually comply with those and, and tax administration can administer them. So the technical side is a very important dimension of measuring success as well, I would think. Okay, thanks. There's, let me just, can I just ask you one question which has come out in the Q&A, um, which is, uh, it's about kind of the effects on revenue across different countries, I think. It's, uh, it's, it says, would reaching consensus on pillar two exacerbate, exacerbate disparities in the world economy if consensus on pillar one is not reached because there would be no attribution of profit to market jurisdictions? I guess this is saying that pillar one is going to be kind of would help those disparities, but pillar two is not. Is that? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, Arim may have his own response to that. But first, one could say that what will be taxed under pillar two is not in developed countries; it's in tax havens. So, will it increase the disparity? In a sense, yes. If you consider that you increase the disparity by shifting the profits from a tax haven to a residence country, but that's not even the right response because. 
what the impact assessment has shown is whatever the rule order is, income inclusion first or under tax payment first, the money will, will, will go to both the source and the residence countries. It's a bit like on the hybrid mismatches. If you kill a hybrid mismatch, because during the uh, discussion on, on action two of the BEPS action plan, we had countries fighting, no, we, 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 we want this rule order first and others say, no, no, we want this. Doesn't matter at the end of the day, because if, if you kill the hybrid, you kill the hybrid and both countries will one or another benefit. And it's hard to say in which circumstances who benefits what, actually both countries will benefit. Now, of course, if the rule order is under tax payment first, developing countries would benefit more than residence countries. If income inclusion uh, comes first, which is likely to be the case if there is a pillar two, developed countries would benefit a bit more, but actually it's shared by both. So no, I wouldn't say it increases inequalities with, with a negative, uh, I mean, on the tone there, which is, well, I mean, we're just making an unfair system even more unfair. It would not be more unfair on the country because you would have taxation. And by the way, taxation, not exclusively in the countries of residence, but also in the, in the, in the source countries because of this economic impact. And just to add, I mean, there is also a subject to tax component in the overall mix. Which would be part of the solution if there is to be a pillar two, which we think is likely to happen at the end of the day. Okay, thank you. Um, I think the, the impact assessment didn't really look across countries, did it? But I mean, there has been other research which people can look at to, to try and get some idea of that. We're, we've, we've already but, run Michael, out just, just one Sorry, thing yes. before you move. I think, and this Please is what do. Pascal has said, we, we, sometimes I hear this that you know rule order determines revenue and it's not that simple I'm not saying it's not important but sort of don't jump and you're not doing this but pervert this and so I want to be very clear that there's behavioral implications so rule order will have an impact but will not determine revenue allocation and, and that, that's not exactly thank you very much to you both for introducing the conference and setting the scene um, we are going to move on to uh, actually looking at some of those, perhaps looking at some of those political and technical differences uh, in more detail by asking members of the steering group to join us. And this next session is going to be chaired by my colleague Richard Collier. But thank you very much, Hakim and Pascal, so far. Thanks. <laughs>